Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to make my presentation off of my own computer, so please give me one moment to boot it up. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for the invitation today to present our company uh, that I work for, Patagonia, and our commitment to sustainability. We haven't expanded yet into Brazil. Uh, and for those of you who perhaps don't know our brand, we make clothing for outdoor sports. We're still private, and we're still owned by Yvonne Chouinard and his family. Yvonne is the guy with the hammer. And he started out as a <clears throat> blacksmith, making pitons and carabiners, hammers, and other hardware for mountain climbers. He opened a blacksmith shop in California, located there because it was two blocks from a good surf break. So he also hired his friends, and we refer to them reverentially as, as dirt bags. And for those of you in the back booth who are translating this into Portuguese, good luck with dirt bag. <laughs> but by the early 70s, uh, Yvonne had expanded the product line to include a few items of clothing for climbers, shirts and pants and shorts, but they were all made with the same commitment to quality and durability as the climbing hardware. So the clothes were designed by dirt bags and they were made for dirt bags and that became the founding culture. And we've captured that and remained faithful to it in the photographs we use in our catalogs, uh, where we captured how we tried to never take ourselves too seriously. We also tried to avoid hiring professional athletes who look like professionals because they were professionals. And, and instead, we used photographs of the more crazy people in the sports that we made gear for. We did everything we could to avoid a, a macho look, and we wanted to emphasize that our gear was also for women as much as for men. So we ran photographs like this one that really tried to tell the story of what it's like to be a mom in a world that isn't always perfect. And we love photographs like this one because they, they came in from our, our customers and the photographers that, ultimately, that, that definitely uh, helped us establish who we are, and, and they were photographs that were definitely not politically correct. You know, including this one that became the most notorious photograph that we ever ran in our catalog. It, it enraged thousands of people. And, and in fact, to get ready for this presentation, I googled Patagonia baby toss and I got 175,000 hits. And most of them were just in the last year with comments like, this photo makes me sick. <laughs> so we had our own view about what risk means and about what managing risk means. And we had our own view about how to raise our kids. So we created one of the very first on-site daycare centers in the United States. And today when visitors come to our headquarters, in California, they often comment how the company feels like a, a family, and that's because it is a family, with mothers and fathers having lunch with their kids, and, and now grandfathers like me having lunch with my granddaughter. Uh, so the daycare is one reason that we're rated among the best companies for women, and in fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, President Obama gave an award to our CEO and also to my wife, Jennifer, who co-founded the, the daycare. And uh, he went up and gave our CEO, uh, Rose Macario, a woman, a, a, big, a big hug. And she later told my wife that, you know, that guy's really buff. <laughs> so 
we haven't been called the coolest company on the planet, uh, you know, for no reason. But but how does that happen? How do you go about creating what is frequently referred to as the coolest company in the world? Well, let me start uh, with just a brief description of our uh, history, uh, beginning with the fact that in the early days we were. We were our own customers. We made the clothes for ourselves, skiers, surfers, and climbers. Uh, and we still are, <clears throat> including uh, Yvonne, the owner, and, and me. Uh, we've been climbing partners for, uh, see the gray hair? It's actually 45 years now. Um, and we've had a lot of wild times together, like this one, after climbing Denali, the highest mountain in North America. And, and, and let's just say that <clears throat> There's much more than just alcohol involved in this photograph. <laughs> so we also have had our adventures in all the wild ends of the world, including a seminal trip that Yvonne made with his friend Doug Tompkins, who is the founder of the North Face, uh, to climb this peak, Fitzroy, in Patagonia, the place, Argentina. So let Yvonne explain that trip. and picked up a 16 millimeter Bolex camera to record the trip. Loaded the car up with surfboards and climbing gear and took off for a 10,000 mile trip down south. I think from the time we decided to go, it was like two weeks before we went. We bought this old van and took off from Ventura. 1968, you gotta remember the Pan American Highway was pretty wild. It, it was dirt road from Mexico City all the way south. It was like being in Montana, Wyoming 100 years ago. Here we're in an area that's the size of the whole American West, with no people. For those of us that grew up going out into the wilds of the world, where nature was basically untouched, we got into our souls a sense of beauty. That trip had a big influence on both Doug and I. It kind of set the course for what we were going to do later in life. For me, it was the best trip of my life. So once they got back, Yvonne expanded the business when he started to sell those few items of clothing that were made for climbers. And in 1973, he decided to spin off that part of the business. This was only five years after that uh, trip to Fitzroy, to Patagonia. And that's where the inspiration came from. Uh, once they were back, uh, uh, that's where the inspiration came from to, to call the, the company uh, Patagonia. And that's also where uh, the label uh, on all of our clothes uh, came from. That highest point on, on the skyline is Fitzroy. So sports like climbing and, and skiing and surfing were the foundation of our company, but our experiences that came from those sports are the direct inspiration for our commitment to environmental protection. When he, Vaughn climbed Fitzroy in the 1960s, it was surrounded by complete wilderness. And when he and I returned there 20 years later, developers had erected the street signs for what today is a small city called Chaltin. So it was seeing things like that, or firsthand the effects of continued clear cutting of the beach forest in Patagonia that will take generations to regrow if they ever do. So seeing these things firsthand is what shaped the values, and directly influence the way we've organized the business. And that starts with our mission to make the best product we can, to do it causing no unnecessary harm, and then to use our success to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. A complex mission, but a complex problem. So let's take a look at that a little more closely beginning with that commitment to make the best product. 
And we have to do that because we know our customers rely on us to give them gear that they can depend on, whether they're surfing in Hawaii or, or climbing the world's hardest peaks. And, and when your jacket can make a difference between your survival or your demise, you better have the best jacket you can get. But our customers also expect us to make that best jacket with no unnecessary harm to the environment or to societies. Now, notice that we don't say cause the least harm, which is the common phrase in English, but we say no unnecessary harm. It's a double negative. If you take out the two negatives, what do you get? You get harm. And we recognize that that is an inevitability of business, and it's our definition of sustainability. All business causes harm. It's our mission to cause no unnecessary harm. How do we do that? <clears throat> well, we make all of our cotton products making only, using only 100% organically grown cotton. And also cotton that's grown using the least amount of water from sources that are in turn sustainable. Now, we also source uh, all of our down only from companies that don't force feed or live pluck the geese. So animal welfare is important to us. And that requires, in the case of our down, to know every company involved in the supply chain. And from this illustration, you can see just how complex that is. To know where every feather comes from all the way back to every farm that grew every single goose. Uh, Perhaps one of the coolest programs we have involves uh, our wetsuits we make for surfers because we use rubber uh, to make the wetsuits that's not from petroleum, like all rubber neoprene is, but rather the latex from a plant that's grown in the uh, southwest part of the United States and uses very little water. Maybe even in our more innovative than, than that, though, is the fact that we decided to give this away, that we've made the intellectual property, the patents, for this product open to anybody that wants to use them. Why? You might think that's counterintuitive to normal business, and perhaps it is, but the reason is that mission. That is the way we can scale the environmental benefits of this environmentally preferred material. So we launched the wetsuits to get attention to these things with a big two-page ad in Rolling Stone magazine with the eye-opening headline. <laughs> we're, we're well known for these kinds of crazy headlines. And for you who are good in English, you'll recognize the double meaning in the word weed. <laughs> so these are some of the ways we make our product with no unnecessary harm. And now let's look at the last part of our mission to use our business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. So we do that in a number of ways. And one of them is to try and influence citizens to be more environmentally responsible. And we do that through a program called 1% for the Planet. And we take 1% of our revenue, not our profits, but our revenue, right off the top. Good year, bad year, it's always 1%. And we give that to nonprofit environmental organizations. So last year, we gave away $6.5 million to 750 nonprofit groups around the world. And most of them are small grassroots organizations with volunteers, like these guys trying to save the Colorado River and its tributaries. And, and who wouldn't give money to guys like this? <laughs> but trying to save rivers uh, is really very important to our company. Uh, and in fact, it's the origin of our commitment to activists and activism. And let's listen to Yvonne explain that origin. In the 70s, the city wanted to channelize the Ventura River. And there was a city council meeting. And so we decided to all go because we were concerned that it was gonna hurt the sand flow. And so we showed up and there were all these scientists there saying, it's not gonna hurt the river because it's a dead river. So just forget about it. And at the end of the talk, a young grad student got up and showed a slideshow of all the life along the river. All the eels and the birds that nest along the river and the raccoons. 
There was still 50 steelhead to go up that polluted river, and it wasn't dead at all. And that brought the house down, and it showed me what one individual can do, the power of one individual. That led to us starting a Friends of the Ventura River, and now we're working on trying to take out a dam upstream that is preventing uh, the steelhead from going up into uh, one of the tributaries. I really like the idea of taking out no longer useful dams. When you take out a dam, that's a real victory. I mean, a concrete victory, so to speak. It's gone. And then that allows fish to migrate up. It uh, stops the water from heating up. People built those dams, and people have the responsibility to take them down. I think all of us are responsible for doing something. I mean, if you can, you're a good speaker, you should get out and speak about the injustices of the world. You know, if you're a good writer, write about it. If you have nothing but free time, you should volunteer for good causes. To do good, you actually have to do something. So what we did was start a campaign, and we made a full-length feature film called Damnation to support the removal of old and useless dams. But we also inspire people to oppose new dams. Uh, that included uh, an example of a dam proposed in Chile on the Baca River, which some of you may know is the largest remaining free-flowing river in Chile. We worked hard on this campaign with our Chilean friends, and we were thrilled when, a few months ago, President Bachelet killed the whole project. Now, we also know that, and we're very aware of the challenges in your country, and uh, the challenges that you face, like the Belamonte Dam. And just know that we want to work with you guys, even though we're not in this country yet, in terms of being here to sell our products. We're here with our values, and that includes our commitment to anybody that wants our help so that you can oppose those dams because we don't believe in them either. So that might seem unusual for a company making outdoor clothes to be involved in dam removal and prevention, but that's what happens when you're privately held and the owner's a fly fisherman who has a different definition of what the real shareholders of a company are, as we explained in this ad, where we said that without a healthy planet, there are no shareholders. So let's go back to that last part of our mission. Uh, to use our business for solutions. And as I said, we try to inspire our customers. And one of the many ways we do that is with a new initiative called Warnware, a partnership with our customers to get the most life out of the clothes that we make and they buy. Because getting the most out of your clothes, making them last as long as possible, using them through their full life, can be the biggest factor in reducing the environmental impact of those clothes. So, so we organized this campaign around what in English are known as the R's of sustainability, beginning with the R for repair. So our customers uh, send us their broken Patagonia products to our repair center, where we have a team that fixes the holes and the tears and replaces the zippers and the buttons. Uh, it's actually the largest apparel repair center in the continent of North America. And a, another really cool way that we help our customers fix their broken products is uh, we ask them to wait for the mobile repair truck to visit their cities. So each year the Warnware truck starts on one coast of the United States and travels across to the opposite coast. And we have a uh, alerted our customers in advance when the truck's coming into their area and they bring their Patagonia products where our repair technicians uh, bring them back to life and make them as good as new. People are so stoked that we made a film about them telling us our stories of their favorite Patagonia products that have been with them for years and after repair are with them for more years to come. So in addition to uh, repair, the Warren Ware partnership includes the idea of uh, resale. <clears throat> and here we encourage our customers to uh, bring us their used Patagonia clothes that they don't want anymore. And then we give them a credit for uh, products, and then we clean up and repair those used clothes, and we sell them back to our customers. And we do that through 
another vehicle that follows the repair vehicle, and uh, it sets up uh, a pop-up store uh, in the street with a selection of used but still high-quality Patagonia jackets <coughs> and fleece and uh, our other products, uh, all uh, looking for a new owner that can put the worn wear badge on the jacket if that's what they want to do. So when their Patagonia gear is truly worn out, we ask them to bring it back to us and, and we'll uh, recycle it using the best technology available. But the most controversial of the R's is <clears throat> the last one, uh, reduce. <clears throat> and this R is based on our conclusion that no matter how much all of us repair and resell and recycle our clothes, or for that matter, all of the stuff that's in our lives, that if we keep acquiring as much stuff as we are now, the health of our planet is going to continue to decline. So it'll do that until we begin to confront the reality that all of us are using too much stuff. So to get that conversation around that inconvenient truth started, three years ago, we ran a now very famous ad, full page in the New York Times. We ran this ad on Black Friday, which is the beginning of the Christmas selling season, uh, when all over the United States, people begin a shopping frenzy. And this ad had our best-selling jacket with that headline, don't buy this jacket. And under it, copy that explained that even though we tried to make that jacket with no unnecessary harm, that all of us together are consuming more than our planet can replenish. And at Patagonia, we're convinced that all of us need to confront this, that if we continue to grow, and some of us has, that, that it is going to bring all of us down. Now, some people call us hypocrites for running this ad, but, but we feel we're doing our part. We're making products with the smallest footprint, also products that last as long as possible so our customers can reduce their own footprints. And they can do that by not buying what they don't need. So like I said, it's a partnership with our customers, a partnership because we are all heading in the same direction, sharing the same vision of what we want the world to look like out there on the horizon line. So, obrigado from all of us at Patagonia and an obrigado to Coan and Alvaro and the team that's given us such a terrific con conference and uh, obrigado to all of you. Thank you.